Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is a very important series on the book of Ephesians, that little tiny book about six chapters long in the middle of the New Testament. And this is lesson number eight in that series for August 19 of 2023, entitled Christ-Shaped Lives and Spirit-Inspired Speech. Um, so let's begin with a word of prayer. Our kind and loving Father, we have come once again to seek to understand you better, to understand what you're trying to say to us through your word, through all of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Help us to understand what we're studying on this occasion is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So what does a Christ-shaped life look like and how would a spirit-inspired speech sound? Jim? From the Bible study guide, Joseph Jose Antonio lived on the street of Palma in Spain as a homeless man for years with gray, straggly hair and beard. Jose took, excuse me, looked over excuse me, looked older than his 57 years. One day, Salva Garcia, the owner of a hair salon, approached Jose and proposed a complete makeover. With Jose in the salon chair, a hardworking team cut, dyed, and styled a tangled bundles of hair and beard. Next, Jose then got a new stylish clothes. Then came the reveal. As Jose sat in front of the mirror, tears came. Is this me? I'm so different. No one is going to recognize me. Later he would add, it wasn't just a change of looks, it changed my life from the Bible study guide. On this wow. Trial. As described in this lesson, Paul went into great depth discussing the changes that take place in the life of a Christian when he departs from his sinful past and is transformed by his relationship with Jesus Christ through the work of the Holy Spirit to become a true follower of God. And that's, of course, from Ephesians 4, 17 through 32 and Colossians 3, 7, 1 through 17. Notice these specific words um, and how do you understand them? Carrie? Uh, it's using uh, Colossians 3, 3 to 4. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Your real life is Christ, and when he appears, then you too will appear with him and share his glory. Yeah, from our Bible study guide. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, from the New Good Testament, news. Good, Good News, news Bible. Bible. Paul had already recognized the distinction, distinct differences between the lives of those who are practicing the multiple evils being carried on in the temple of Artemis or Diana in Ephesus and the lives of true Christians. The transformation that took took or takes place when one became or becomes a true Christian was, is remarkable. First of all, it erased any distinction between Jews and Gentiles. In Ephesians 4, 1 through 16, Paul laid out in a straightforward manner the differences between those who were true Christians and those who were following the old Gentile heathen ways. But then in Ephesians 4, 17 and following, he suggested that such a transformation is like a whole new life. Christians must completely abandon all their evil habits which they practiced in their former lives. Jennifer? From the Bible Study Guide, in Ephesians 4, 17 through 24, Paul contrasts Gentile lifestyle, which he regards as undermining unity, from Ephesians 4, 17 through 19, with truly Christian patterns of life that nourish it. Ephesians 4, 20 through 24. As we read Paul's sharp critique of the depraved Gentile lifestyle, we should recall his conviction that Gentiles are redeemed by God through Christ and offered full partnership in the people of God. From some verses in Ephesians 2 and 3. In Ephesians 4, 17 through 19, then he is offering a limited and negative description of, quote, Gentiles in the flesh. So, and if you read that, if we had time, well, we'll look at it in most, well, a little bit later. Um, it's a pretty raw picture. I mean, as we've already suggested, what was going on in that temple of Artemis, it was, was pretty, pretty foul. Clearly, Paul was suggesting that no matter what one's background, 
formerly Jewish or formerly heathen Gentile, when she or he becomes a Christian, all are brothers and sisters in Christ. From Ephesians 2, verses 11 to 18, you Gentiles by birth called the uncircumcised by the Jews who call themselves the circumcised, which refers to what men do to their bodies. Remember what you were in the past. At that time, you were apart from Christ. You were foreigners and did not belong to God's chosen people. You had no part in the covenants, which were based on God's promises to his people, and you lived in this world without hope and without God. But now, in union with, uh, Jesus, with Christ Jesus, you who used to be far away have been brought near by the blood of Christ, and in the footnote it says, or by the sacrificial death of Christ. For Christ himself has brought, has brought us peace by making Jews and Gentiles one people. With his own body, he broke down the wall that separated them and kept them enemies. He abolished the Jewish law with its commandments and rules in order to create out of the two races one new people in union with himself, in this way making peace. Let me interrupt for a second here. How did the life and death of Jesus break down a wall? We're going to be talking more about that, but how did that happen? What did he do? I mean, basically, just to uh, Gordon, were you going to comment? Well, he merged Gentiles and Jews into Christians. Right, sure. And what he did is he said he just basically did that by treating everybody the same. Uh, my wife and I are just reading some material for our worships in the morning at home, and we're talking about how Jesus dealt with the Samaritans at their the Samaritan woman and all that kind of stuff. And he didn't treat them any different than the Jews. The disciples were standing there with their mouths hanging open because they couldn't believe this was happening. But he breaks down the wall. He treats everybody the same. That's, that's what we're talking about. Okay, go ahead. By his death on the cross, Christ destroyed their enmity. By means of the cross, he united both races into one body and brought them back to God. So... Christ came and preached the good news of peace to all, to you Gentiles who were far away from God and to the Jews who were near to him. It is through Christ that all of us, Jews and Gentiles, are able to come in the one spirit into the presence of the Father. Good News Bible. Okay, my question again. How did Christ break down the barrier that separated Jews and Gentiles? He treats them, everyone, as a son or daughter of God, and he expects them to treat each other as brothers and sisters. So he's calling all of them Christians. So when they came to church, Paul says, okay, you're going to sit together. I don't care if you're a Jew or a Gentile. You're going to sit together. You're going to eat together. We're going to be brothers and sisters. That's what he's saying. You mentioned the Samaritan woman. The disciples went to buy food. Mm hmm you know, leaving Christ there alone, a mm -hmm. lonely place, all alone. Fraternizing with a foreign woman. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> What's wrong? I, they, they did the wonders. Just, are we following the right guy? Yeah. Come to think. Wow. They should have left someone there to, to guard <laughs> Keep him. Keep an eye on him. Yeah. <laughs> well, how did his death on the cross destroy their enmity and bring them back to God? Well, we just, two. Yeah, we could spend a long time discussing those questions, but yes, go ahead, Myra. Ephesians 2, 19 to 22 might have some answers. So then, you Gentiles are not foreigners or strangers any longer. You are now fellow citizens with God's people and members of the family of God. You too are built upon the foundation laid by the apostles and the prophets, the cornerstone being Christ Jesus himself. He is the one who holds the whole building together and makes it grow into a sacred temple dedicated to the Lord. In union with him, you too are being built together with all the others into a place where God lives through his spirit. So let's, let's, let's try to picture that in our minds. Okay, you come to church and you're on your way to church and you're not sure, you know, people are watching you. So you stay away. If you're a Jew, you stay away from the Gentiles. 
if you're a Gentile, you sort of stay away from the Jews. But when you go into church, what happens? Oh. Everybody is one. That's a transformation, I can tell you. A transformation. In Ephesians 2, 19 through 20, 22, Paul said that there, if one is a new Christian, former Jew or former Gentile, she or he can be transformed to become a building block in the Christian temple, the foundations of which is Jesus Christ himself. So God's building a new building, a new temple. Paul hinted at something else even more remarkable. Eventually, Christians will be elevated to a position beside Christ in heaven and into fellowship with him, with all, I'm sorry, of God's faithful beings throughout the universe. And some of us have talked a lot of time about these three passages. Ephesians 1, 7 to 10, Ephesians 3, 7 to 10, and Colossians 1, 19 and 20. It says that God is going to bring the whole universe together, not just Jews and Gentiles. Paul was contrasting a lifestyle that consists of abandoned sinning to the life of a Christian which is remade in the image of Jesus Christ. Paul called the former condition calloused spirituality. <laughs> That's quite a name. Mm -hmm. Such people do not know how to live. They are separated from God and His saving grace and they are in a downward spiral of sin and depravity. So what has been your personal experience and those of others around you in this contrasting picture? Do we see groups of people who can't get along with each other? All you have to do is listen to the news every morning. So and so went to such and such a party and shot five people. You know, what, what does that tell us? Where is the human... Some kid goes into school, steals his mom's gun from home, shoots a teacher. Six years old. Yeah. Well, in Ephesians 4, 20 through 22, Paul said that the true Christian actually puts on Christ. He does not just learn about Christ, but rather he learns Christ. From the writings of Ellen White, it is a law both of the intellectual and the spiritual nature that by beholding we become changed. The mind gradually adapts itself to the subjects upon which it is allowed to dwell. It, be it becomes assimilated to that which it is accustomed to love and reverence. Man will never rise higher than his standard of purity or goodness or for truth. If self is his loftiest ideal, he will never attain to anything more exalted. Rather, he will constantly sink lower and lower. The grace of God alone has the power to exalt man. Left to himself, his course must inevitably be downward. Wow. Great Controversy 555, five, five. that's an incredible mm -hmm. passage. Okay. So what happens to a person whose whole attention is on worldly things? Mm -hmm. Paul tells us that the adoption of a Christ, this is from our Bible study guide, of a Christ-shaped life requires three processes, which he expresses through clothing imagery, and this, of course, he got from the Old Testament. One, to put off or turn away from the old way of life, Ephesians 4.22, and that's, of course, right out of, of Zechariah uh, 3, 1 to 5. Number two, to experience inner renewal. And three, to put on the new godlike pattern of life. Paul's metaphor reflects the use of clothing in the Old Testament as a symbol for both sinfulness and salvation. <clears throat> in ancient times, men wore a knee-length tunic as an undergarment, and a cloak or mantle to offer protection from the sun. Similarly, women wore a tunic and a robe. The cultures reflected in the Bible were subsistence ones. Uh, garments were precious and expensive and were kept for a long time. It would have been, I mean, we think about the, remember the garment that they took from Jesus as they were crucifying him was all of one piece. They knew how to start out and they started weaving and weaving and Pretty soon you got a garment with arms and every, everything, full length, and it's all, all woven, one continuous. Amazing. Mm. Garments were precious and expensive when were kept for a long time. It would have been unusual to own more than one set of clothing. 
the quality and style of those garments signaled the identity and status markers about the wearer. To change one's clothes, exchanging one set of clothes for another, was an unusual and important event, rather than the trifling occurrence it is in many cultures today. Paul imagines the change in life to be as noticeable as exchanging one set of clothing for another would have been in this first century context. So what is the difference, the crucial, the crucial difference between learning about Christ and learning to know Christ from our Bible study guide? This relationship with Christ is called faith. And remember that Romans 14, 23, that says what? Anything that takes us closer to Christ is described as faith. Anything that takes us away from Christ is sin. Faith, sin, opposites. In Ephesians 4, 25 to 29, Paul specifically told them to stop some very common heathen Gentile practices, lying, becoming angry, robbing, and using some harmful words. Paul repeatedly uses, Bible study guide again, Paul repeatedly uses an interesting structure in Ephesians 4, 25 through 32, which is illustrated by Ephesians 4, 25 in the New King James Version. A negative command, put away lying, is followed by a positive command next, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. And then a rationale, for we are, all member, we are members of one another. So don't do this. Do to this because of what? We're brothers and sisters. We're part of a unity. Uh, which seems to be mean because we are members of one body and so related to one another as parts of that one body. Paul's exhortation to speak truth is not an invitation to confront other church members with a tactless recitation of facts. Paul alludes to Zechariah 8.16, which exhorts speaking the truth as a way of fostering peace. Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Tuesday. Jim, you want to take that on? Zechariah 8, 16. The Lord Almighty said, These are the things you should do. Speak the truth to one another. In the courts give real justice, the kind that brings peace. So Paul firmly believed in the transformative power of Christianity. He believed that thieves could become working benefactors of those in the church. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4, 11. Carrie? Make it your aim to live a quiet life, to mind your own business, and to earn your own living, just as we told you before. <laughs> okay. Well, that wouldn't fit today, would it? <laughs> wow, think, think about that. I mean, Look you at know. all the stores that are closing. And <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <It'd be> abs- <laughs> yeah, okay. Paul imagines any negative expression not being just stopped but replaced by a statement that exhibits three criteria. One is good for building up. Two fits the occasion. And three gives grace to those who hear. That's from Ephesians 4.29. If only all our words could be like that. Yes. And the, and so have a don't, Bible study. Yeah. don't just stop using bad words. Use good words. And use them intentionally for the purpose of building up the church. Yeah. Wow. This kind of transformation might seem impossible to those first learning about Christianity. It would be impossible without a very special help. Jennifer? From Ephesians 4.30. And do not make God's Holy Spirit sad, for the Spirit is God's mark of ownership on you, a guarantee that the day will come when God will set you free from the Good News Bible. Notice that when the Holy Spirit is grieved, he does not leave us. He is just sad. He wants Christians to believe that they belong to God through the work of the Holy Spirit. So how often do we grieve the Holy Spirit? In Ephesians 1, 13 to 14, Paul had already said, Gordon? From Good News Bible, and you also became God's people when you heard the true message, the good news that brought you salvation. You believed in Christ, and Christ put his stamp of ownership on you by giving you the Holy Spirit he had promised. <clears throat> the Spirit is the guarantee that we shall receive what God has promised his people, and this assures us that God will give complete freedom to those 
who are his. Let us praise his glory. Good News Bible. Okay, so remember that in this context, Paul has said that the goal is not just to baptize people to get them into the church. There's the next step is if you die, you need to be raised from the dead and then you need to be taken to heaven standing at, beside the throne of God. And the, the Christian experience is not done until you're there. And of course, we know after that it's, it's going to be a perfect experience. Okay, Myra? From the Bible Study Guide, Paul underlines the full divinity of the Spirit as the Holy Spirit of God and highlights the personhood of the Spirit by portraying the Holy Spirit as grieving. See in Romans, 1 Corinthians. A number of passages there. Okay. Romans 8, 16 and 26 and 27. Charles? God's Spirit joins himself to our spirits to declare that we are God's <coughs> children. <coughs> Sorry. In the same way, the Spirit also comes to help us, weak as we are, for we do not know how we ought to pray. The Spirit himself pleads with God for us in groans that the words cannot express. And God, who sees into our hearts, knows what the thoughts of the Spirit is, because the Spirit pleads with God on behalf of his people and in accordance with his will. Okay, now we must tread with care. This is for our Bible study guide. We must tread with care in discussing the mystery of the Godhead. The Spirit is both one with and distinct from the Father and the Son. Quote, the Spirit has his own will and chooses accordingly. He can be grieved and blasphemed against. Such expressions are not fit for a mere power or influence, but are characteristics of a person. Is the Spirit then a person just like you and me? No. We use limited human terminology to describe the divine, and the Spirit is what human beings can never be. That's from Paul Peterson, the book God in Three Persons, and quoted in our Bible study guide for Wednesday, August 16. Um, okay, Jim? From Ellen White, we have been brought together as a school, and we need to realize that the Holy Spirit, who is much a person as God is a person, is walking through these grounds that the Lord God is our keeper, our helper. He hears our every word, utters, excuse me, every word we utter and knows every thought of the mind. Ellen White from Manuscript. Of okay, Carrie, Jesus. you know where that was spoken, don't you? Avondale. I've been Avondale. Been place many, many times. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Avondale School back in 1899. Yeah. Okay, Carrie, I guess you're next. Go ahead. I'm just going to say now it's the university. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Bible study guide there. Yes. It is the Holy Spirit of God who lives in such intimate contact with us that our actions are said to affect him. We share life with a member of the Godhead committed to us in a durable relationship that seals us until the end of time. What should be our faith response to this amazing truth? And that's okay. at Abbott, uh, <coughs> at our Sabbath school Bible study. Jennifer? From the Bible study guide, in the light of Christ's return, what attitudes and behaviors related to speech should, we, should be discarded? What attitudes and behaviors should be embraced? Ephesians 4, 31 through 32. I mean, Paul has made it pretty clear what's not acceptable, hasn't he? Paul was trying to make it clear that there is a huge difference between the way true Christians live and the way followers of Satan live. Do you think those differences are going to become less and less apparent or more and more apparent as we approach the end? Wow. Paul finally went on in Ephesians 4, 17 to 32, identifying six vices that must be completely removed from the lives of Christians. Christians should be Kind, tender-hearted, complete, uh, I'm sorry, and forgiving, completely stopping all ten bitterness, all malice, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander. Wow. What is a clamor? Clamor, that means... I mean, for something that doesn't yeah. belong to you, or yeah, positions right. and so forth. Yeah. Putting other people down. Okay. 
from Good News Bible, Ephesians 4, 31 and 32. Get rid of all bitterness, passion, and anger. No more shouting or insults. No more hateful feelings of any sort. Instead, be kind and tenderhearted to one another and forgive one another as God has forgiven you through Christ. Good news, okay, Bible. Okay, now I'm going to ask a, t a tough question. Did Paul say that because that was what was actually going on in the church? Mm. What does it say? No more shouting. When he says, Get rid of it. To your tender hearted, forgiving one another, God has forgiven you through Christ, isn't that talking to church members? It says, Get rid of bitterness, passion, and anger, suggesting that they had some bad qualities, a lot of bad qualities. Ooh. Okay, it gets better. Like us. It gets better. Myra? Well, the Bible study guide says, the last of these translates the Greek word blasphemia, which, is, which English has borrowed as a technical term for a demeaning speech against God. However, the Greek term identifies speech that defames either God or other humans as slander or evil speaking. In this list, attitudes, bitterness, wrath, and anger seem to boil over into angry speech, clamor, and slander. In essence, Paul demilitarizes Christian speech. The attitudes that drive angry speech and the rhetorical, rhetorical. rhetorical strategies that employ it are to be removed from the Christian's arsenal. Christian community will, will flourish and unity of the church be fostered only where these things are laid aside. So, no bad language, no accusing, accusations against other church members, only love and kindness, tenderheartedness. Wow. Paul was telling Christians that through the transforming power of Christ and the Holy Spirit, all evil is to be abandoned completely. Jesus really had suggested the same thing. Charles? Matthew 6, 12, 14, 15. Forgive us the wrongs we have done as we forgive the wrongs that others have done to us. 14. If you forgive others the wrongs they have done to you, your Father in heaven will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive the wrongs you have done. Good News Bible. Wow. And then Ellen White, let your conversation be of such a nature that you will have no need of repentance. Grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. If you have love in your heart, you will seek to establish and build up your brother in the most holy faith. If a word is dropped that is detrimental to the character of your friend or brother, do not encourage this evil speaking. It is the work of the enemy. It is the work of the enemy. Kindly remind the speaker that the word of God forbid, forbids that kind of conversation. From the Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald by Ellen White in June 5, 1888, just before the great 1888 General Conference. And I remember a cartoon, which I probably shouldn't mention right now, but, you know, there's rumors about how ladies pass stories across the back fence. The cartoon shows this back fence, and one lady is saying a bunch of stuff to the other lady, and she says, other lady says, I don't pass along that kind of information. And the other lady gets this startled look on her face. She says, so you're the bottleneck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's good. It illustrates the point, I think, huh? Okay, Bible study guide. How would your congregation change if you and each member uh, were to take and live a pledge consisting of such statements as the following? One, uh, I'll read one, and then Jim, you can read two. We'll go on. I wish for my influence within the Seventh-day Adventist Church family and beyond to be positive, uplifting, faith-building, and morale-boosting. Jim? And recalling Christ's call for unity and love, I will expend, 
Excuse me, I'll expend more energy affirming those doing and saying things I believe to be good than in pointing out the failings of those I believe to be wrong. Okay, and lift up the church, in other words. Gary? When I do disagree with someone, I will make my respect for my fellow believer clear. I will assume his or her integrity and commitment to Christ. I will offer my differing opinion gently, not stridently. Wow. Jennifer? And for I will live joyfully, looking for every opportunity to build up and affirm my fellow church members as I await the return of Christ. And a lot of verses there to support that from our Bible study guide for Friday. Paul had made some strong points in this section of Ephesians. Notice some of them, and here's a kind of uh, an early summary. From the Bible study guide, review the 11 times in Ephesians that Paul describes the three members of the Godhead as working closely together for the salvation of mankind. How humankind. Do, that's, that's, humankind. How do, is there a difference between mankind and humankind? Well, it depends Besides on... Besides the spelling? <laughs> it depends on... There are some people who think the humankind has to be the correct word. We're not just, to, we're not just talking about men anymore. We never were. How, <laughs> do, how does this repeated emphasis inform our understanding of the Godhead? And there are multiple references, references. from Ephesians. Yeah. Okay, so how does Paul's... And then, go ahead. And then it continues. How does Paul's counsel about Christian speech apply in the age of computer-mediated communication, which is too often used for cyberbullying and anonymous online character assassinations. Wow. All from Friday's Bible study guide. And if you watch some of the <coughs> stuff that's being computer-generated and you, you see how they're taking pictures and just m modifying them in every way imaginable, making people looking like, you know, machines and machines looking like people and all that kind of stuff, our kids growing up, they're not going to know what to believe anymore. And I'm sure that's exactly what the devil wants. He's been doing that for a long time, apparently. Oh, but it's getting so much worse. But the, the grade schools in, the, in these crazy stuff that's going on in, this, in the school system, and now it's clear up into the colleges and universities. There's yeah. really no hope for it. Paul said that the transformation that takes place when one becomes a Christian should be obvious to all around us. Is it obvious to everyone around us? It's not just like taking off an old set of clothes temporarily while we sleep at night, putting them on again in the morning. Paul says those old sinful behaviors need to be thrown away and removed permanently. Okay, where are we? Uh, yeah. In summary, as quoted from the Bible study guide, Number one, the Christian new life quantitatively contrasts... No, no, qualitatively. Qual sorry, qualitatively contrasts with the old worldly life. So what is he trying to say there? It's not just different, a bunch of different things that are different. These things are essentially different. They're very, very different, okay? The difference between mm -hmm. quantity and quality. Yeah. Number two... A change of life and of identity is, impossible, is possible only in Christ and in the Holy Spirit. Number three, the presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives leads to the transformation from our worldview, identity, lifestyle, conversation, attitudes, and relationships. If we are living in a constant relationship with God, how does that impact us? Charles? Bible study guide. Contemporary society values inclusivity, acceptance, preservation, and promotion of local cultures, lifestyles, and world, world views. The old style missionaries are being criticized for disregarding the local, national, or tribunal tribal cultural heritages and for modeling local or regional churches in the mission field on Western interpretation of Christianity 
and their lifestyle. While um, critical contextualization certainly has its place in missions, two very relevant questions are raised. What elements of the local culture could be celebrated and preserved, and what elements of the local culture are part of the old self and must be abandoned as sinful and of this world? I'm going to interrupt now for a second. There are so many examples where even we as Seventh-day Adventists have done terrible things. There was a time when because of political influence and be, because of the, the environment that some churches in the Middle East, in you can guess what kind of countries, had signs over them. Adventist churches says, no Muslim allowed in here. Uh, oh, yeah. uh, well, they thought they had to do that to survive. So where where, where do we draw the line? Where do we decide, okay, how much, I mean, you know, um, there's no reason for people in Africa who are standing up in front need to be wearing a shirt and a tie. That's not... The, Even this time. It, yeah, they say you've got to have a tie to stand up in front. Yeah. That, that doesn't need to happen. There's no reason for that to happen in Africa or Asia or other places. Anywhere, right? Uh, or California. Or California, <laughs> probably. <laughs> but the question is, how much should we allow our church behaviors to be influenced by the world around us? That's the question. Several points could be highlighted here in answer to these questions. First, in Ephesians 4, 17 through 32, Paul contrasts the world of sin, futility, ignorance, darkness, impurity, anger, slander, and deceit with the world of God's grace, righteousness, knowledge, light, purity, honesty, kindness, compassion, forgiveness, and truth. Wow. <laughs> Ultimately, the evaluating principle of a culture or lifestyle is not an ideology or philosophy such as rationalism, empiricism, modernism, pragmatism, utilitarianism, or postmodernism. Rather, the biblical principle of evaluating any culture or way of life is, quote, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. And really, what we're saying is, and this is a tough, this is a tough thing, we all need to be more like Jesus. Well, do we need to dress like Jesus? Do we need to go hair long like Jesus? Do we need, you know, those are challenging things. This principle, when put into action, demonstrates God's love for us and our love for him and reveals God's righteousness. Okay, that's one. Second, and consequently, uh, maybe go ahead, Jim, you go ahead and read that. Second and consequently, Paul does not discuss anthropology or the preservation of the world's culture her cultural heritage. He does not engage in classifying world cultures and evaluating some cultures in the light of others. Rather, he calls for all cultures, Jewish or Gentile, to be evaluated in the light of the gospel of Christ, of Jesus Christ, and in the light of the culture and the lifestyle of his kingdom. In his epistles, Paul finds a lot of to rebuke in the Jewish culture and calls them to repent. Let me interrupt there for a second. Uh, what do you do if, and we, I've, I've actually had short biblical tours in Turkey on, on different occasions, and we had a university trained guide from Turkey there, and I said, well, how do you decide? Because he was talking a lot of Christian kind of ideas, and I said, well, how do you decide whether you're a Christian or a Muslim? Oh, he says, that's easy. When you're born, stamped in your birth certificate, Muslim. Yeah. <laughs> stamped in your birth certificate, Muslim. Hmm. Well, obviously, it didn't inhibit him from believing what he believed. And he said to us, he said, in the universities and so forth, even in those countries, there's a lot of stuff just... Well, you probably know about some of the, some of the, well, they just had an election there and the, the president who's been very staunch 
Muslim is, was just about voted out, not quite. So, I'm sorry, go ahead. Paul tells the Gentiles that God welcomes them into his kingdom, his covenant, and his church. But Paul does not shy away from characterizing much of the Gentile worldview, polytheistic, metho mythological, and philosophical, and way of the and way of life as futile and sinful, Ephesians 4, 18 and 19. Thus, if the gospel highlights sin in the lives of church members and in their cultures, they must confess it, has sin, confess it as sin and abandon it. Otherwise, salvation is longer salvation, no longer salvation from sin, but cultural justification for the tolerance of sinful lifestyle. True. Okay, we come well, just a second. Let's think about that for a moment. So how much of our culture should we be setting aside so we can live true Christian lives? And if we go to other parts of the world and we try to evangelize them, we try to bring them the good news, do we say... I mean, you know that in old days, when you, when you baptize someone from... Muslim background, they had to change their name from a Muslim name to a Christian name. And they, in many cases, that was, you either had to run away from your family or you had to be killed. Muslims were told if someone in your family changes its, its religion, yeah. they're supposed to die. Yeah, I grew up in this. So even in Adventist school, 17 years off, you see, mm -hmm. Well, it, it, and I'd always say, if, if it does not interfere with my faith, leave this custom alone. What's yeah. wrong? Yeah. Well, it's, it's like the guy with the stamp in his, in, on his birth certificate. Right. The idea was if, if your name is Muhammad, right. then you're supposed to you know, believe in Muslim teachings. Right. Um, All this business of, of being part of the church but what is the what is the goal ultimate goal of being part of the church? Isn't it to, to understand eternal for eternal life? Yeah. Well, what Paul is saying here, the the purpose of the church ultimately is for us to stand around the throne of God in heaven. Amen. That's where which we're, is would be eternal life, right? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And so Jesus in his in his in Matthew 19, he has only six things to do. You don't have to get all these into this culture stuff. You don't kill. You don't steal. You don't bear fa false witness. You don't uh, adulterate. Uh, you honor your parents and love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. I, I, I like things to be succinct. Mm -hmm. And you can fluff it up with all kinds of uh, yeah. frosting. But that's the, that, those are the words of Jesus. There's mm -hmm. not the interpretation by, by the Bible study guide and, and, and interpreted by... Uh, uh, the, the, the editor of this program. Yeah, well, it, that, that's it, true. It, but, but it, uh, there, you know, you, wouldn't, you couldn't take those words just that and, and, and say that they forbid uh, cuss, cuss, swearing. So, but you don't, you don't believe in swearing. Uh, so, I mean, there, there are something, I mean, I'm not arguing about that at all, but I'm just saying there are some additional things that that we need to go beyond those simple things. Those are foundational, I agree, but we need to go beyond them. Okay, go ahead, True. True, we come to God as we are in filthy rags of sin, but we also, to me, we do not come to Him to remain in those rags. Rather, we come to God to remove those rags, to be washed and walk into the new list of life, Romans okay, I'm 6, 4. I'm gonna interrupt for just a second. Where does that idea come from? In the Old Testament, uh, it's from uh, we've used it Zechariah. many many Zechariah. Zechariah three one to five exactly, okay. Without this understanding, Christianity will lose its power and message of salvation. Christianity is not a religion of affirmation, of affirming humanity in its sinful ways. Rather, the biblical message challenges all nations, tribes, tongues, and cultures to evaluate themselves in the light of scripture and accept God's washing and working of the Holy Spirit to regenerate us. In Paul's gospel, we cannot afford to protect a sinful aspect of our lives. 
by excusing it on the grounds that it is part of our cultural heritage or worldview. In fact, all that is sinful is eventually self-destructive. Sin destroys cultures and nations rather than upholding or edifying them. Okay, so how much uh, of that kind of stuff is going on all around us, even in the church in our day? And that, that last portion of that paragraph, if it self-destructive, sin destroys cultures and so on. But if you have, if sin is a disease, basically the Old Testament is written in that period, what do you need? You need healing. healing. Yeah. And you, a lot of it has to be healing of your, the way you think oh. about and uh, God, because mm -hmm. the, the <laughs> Bible is messed up, the, uh, via translations, is messed up the picture of God. Well, in misunderstandings, that's well. Obviously, what it that's to, yeah. that's how it that comes about because of a misunderstanding. Uh, yeah. on the part of the translator. Okay, Carrie, why don't you pick up there? The third one, God celebrates diversity and cultural expressions in harmony with the gospel of His kingdom. And I'm going to interrupt again. Sorry, I just keep inter. We have some of us have trouble getting along with people from other cultures. When we get to heaven, we're going to live with people from all cultures yeah, yeah. and all generations. How are we going to survive? Yeah. I, have, I have often suggested that's the reason why we get married to someone of the opposite sex, <laughs> so we can learn how to live with somebody who doesn't think like us. Uh, that, that's a great st uh -oh. <laughs> statement there, Ken. <laughs> it's true. It's obvious, I right? I didn't get any argument from me on it. It's a great one. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> well, okay. For, the, for this reason, the gospel does not call for the complete uniformization of all cultures. Exactly. When the culture builds on the values and lifestyle of Christ, it will only prosper and be enriched. Okay. So how can we incorporate that into our daily beliefs and our practices. Yeah. Okay. From the Bible Study Guide, in a 1992 article in Ministry Magazine, Borg Schantz, a Okay, I have to just tell you, yes. Borg Schantz, as that's the way he pronounced his name, was a very good personal friend of ours when we, we were in Africa. He visited us often, stayed in our home and so forth. We knew him very well and he was a what we would call a great missiologist. What's a missiologist? A mission. mission He's a mission. Talking about his, he worked with the Mission Institute. Uh, basically, he was saying, okay, and he's talking about these very things we're talking about here. How do we come in with the good news of the gospel? And yet, uh, I mean, because in the, in the past, we've said, okay, if we're going to be a pastor, you've got to stand up in front wearing a white shirt and a tie. Well, that's not necessary. The question is, where do you draw the line between what things you really need to set aside because you're now a Christian and those things? Well, no, those are okay. And he basically taught there are some things that are always good. There are some things that are sort of borderline and you sometimes they're, they're okay and sometimes they aren't. And then there's some things that are always bad. And we have to, we have a, difficult time. I mean, that's a challenge we have every day in our lives to say, okay, we get rid of the bad things. We make, we, we try to make wise decisions about those things which are somewhere in the middle, which went on, went on obviously one thing, one or the other, and we adopt the things which are good. Uh, that was one of his messages. Okay, now you can hear, you've heard my personal testimony. Go ahead. <laughs> So he was a celebrated Seventh-day Adventist missiologist. He proposed three guiding principles of contextualization for the Seventh-day Adventist approach to cross-cultural mission. First, the cross-cultural missionary must correctly understand the biblical stories and teachings in their original context. Wow. Uh, think about how that would impact our... Mm -hmm. Okay. Second, the cross-cultural missionary must accurately distinguish between universal biblical teachings and their principles and his or her own cultural values and experience. Though these customs must be, or may be, contextualized, biblical principles, such as the Sabbath, cannot be compromised. Okay, so there we have it. There's some things which 
we, you know, they, they have to stand. And there are other things which maybe can be contextualized. Okay? And, and wisdom is to decide which is which. Exactly. A lot of wisdom. And to be consistent. Yes. And to be consistent. Yes. Whatever you do, you need to I, try to be consistent. That's, that's another challenge, yeah. Well, some are consistently wrong. <laughs> yeah. And that's the third group I talked about, consistently wrong, yeah. yeah. Okay, um, go ahead. Third, the cross-cultural missionary must develop a genuine and profound interest in and understanding of the culture of the people whom he or she serves. And I have said, um, and I've worked in several different situations in Africa, you can't really be a cross-cultural missionary until you learn the local language. It's not easy. It's a challenge. I learned how to speak Chenyanja first, and then I learned how to speak Kiswahili and some other languages to a much lesser extent. But you have to, you have to, you, you just, because the language is based on how you perceive cultural things. And you can't, you just, you can't fully understand what's going on in someone's mind if you don't know the language in which they're thinking. And there are 20 major languages in Kenya yeah. alone. <laughs> yeah. How many? Yeah. 20. 20. <laughs> yeah. 20 major languages in Kenya. There's 120 in Tanzania. <laughs> Good yeah. luck. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Where are we? In the next section. Um, when all these elements are taken into consideration, the ultimate contextualization principle is that while demonstrating sensitivity to various elements of the local culture, the missionaries must allow the biblical absolutes to determine the new teachings and practices of the converts. Shant, is that Shantz? Shantz. Shantz. German? Um, I, think, I think he's a Scandinavian, yeah. Shantz shared a, quote, note of warning to the leaders of Seventh-day Adventist mission and evangelism. Christian churches are tempted to lose hold of pure doctrine and objective ethics when they accept uncritically that God's word is always and at all places culturally and historically related. The wow. contextualization process <laughs> definitely raises some problems. Adapting biblical teachings to the cultures of the world will bring the communicator into contact with elements that are false, evil, and even demonic. And I, I am I love watching all the stuff that's going on with AI and so forth in culture now. I am sure that some of that is purely demonic. Anyway, go ahead. The sad result of going too far is a damaging syncreticism forcing opposing religious elements to coexist. For this reason, Shantz concluded, in all cultures, including our own, there are customs condemned by the gospel, and what is rejected by the scriptures must be rejected by the missionaries and national leaders. However, this principle does not need to make us more insensitive to the innocent culture of the local peoples. Rather, Shantz prayed that the Lord of Mission must grant us wisdom to differentiate between universals that must be proclaimed worldwide and the optional variables of Western culture. Wow. Yeah, he was a great, great man. Died way too young. Mm -hmm. Well, continuing from yeah. Bible study guide, the new humans. Throughout history, the espousers of philosophies, ideolo ideolo ideologies, and powers claim or have claimed the ability to radically change humanity. One example of such a, an ideology is Marxism, especially as promoted in the Soviet Union. Driven by the optimism of the 70s, the Soviets promoted the idea that they, the Soviets, were in the process of advancing human evolution by bringing about the next upgrade in the human species, the Soviet people. Wow. The Soviet people would leave behind the old religious and ideological capitalistic baggage and evolve collect collectively into the new Marxist human. As history shows, the Soviet project ended in utter failure. Instead of creating a new and better type of human, the Soviet people, the story ended with the 
widely circulated pejorative phrase, homo sovieticus. <laughs> wow. Not homo sapiens, but no. uh, yeah. Do you want me to continue? Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Speaking of evolution, especially in the second half of the 20th century, such theistic evolutionists as Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, I'm sure I slaughtered that, promoted the idea of the emergence of the new human, the spiritual human. While Teilhard de Chardin, while, while he believed that humans are still engaged in the process of evolution from animal form, he envisioned an omega moment in the future when humans would leave behind their old heritage of predatory behavior and evolve into new humans characterized by global consciousness and universal love. I wonder where he got those ideas. Okay. And uh, Myra, why don't you pick it up there? These are only two examples of the ideologies and philosophies that strove to drastically change sinful humans into new humans. Although these philosophies seem radical, in fact, all and most philosophies and sciences operate on the assumption that they have the power to transform humanity and human society. This assumption reveals at least two important observations. On the one hand, all of these movements highlight the deep-seated human desire for the new human, with all the profound renewal that in that ideal embodies. On the other hand, all these philosophies have ended in failure, even if some showed what seemed like initial success. The latest demonstration of this phenomenon is to rise the rise of postmodernism with its critique of modernism, which is completely trusted by the world as being capable of delivering truth about our origin, origin, development, and destiny of humanity and the entire universe, while postmodernism is attempting to create the new man and is already being increasingly clear to the people that the philosophy does not have the answer for the new humanity. I need to interrupt there Go because ahead. we're about out of time. But clearly, people have tried all kinds of ways to create the perfect society and they have all failed. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, help us to recognize what is good, what is probably okay, and what is bad, and to make the, make the right choices, even in our situation. And especially if we work with others who are of a different culture, help us to understand them when possible, learn to speak their language, whether it's an actual physical language or just understanding their thinking so that we can spread to them the good news of the gospel in the best possible way is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.